Hello. So, here's the stitch. My name is Hugh Ramis, and this is like just, what am I saying? This is episode two, Cooking Up Crime. Basically, we're gonna talk about the disappearance of Maura Murray today. I have fried rice. It was in my house like maybe four seconds before my grandmother put it into a different container. We're just doing, we're living it up, you know? Anyway. Maura Murray was born on May 4th, 1982. Maura was born in Hanson, Massachusetts. She was about five foot seven and she weighed about 120 pounds. She was actually a really, like she was a star athlete in her high school. She ran track. She's really good at track. And it kind of like plays into later. Anyway, her dad was Frederick. He is the only like person I'm going to name in this story because he comes up quite a lot. I'm my coffee. I just found that it was kind of like disrespectful in a way to mention her siblings' names or even her mom's name for that matter. Um, but I'm only mentioning mentioning Fred because it comes up a lot later on. But all their names are on Google and you can just figure it out there. So Maura was four of five children. She was an Irish Catholic. Her parents divorced when she was about six years old. Yeah. And she lived with her mother primarily. I'm assuming her parents are somewhat of a joint custody situation. Like, she lived with her dad, like, every other weekend, stuff like that. That's what I had, anyway. She graduated from Whitman Hanson Regional High School in Massachusetts. And she was accepted into the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York. She started going to college doing chemical engineering. And that sounds really boring. And thank God she changed. She actually transferred to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And she changed her major to nursing, which is my major. How exciting. Me and Maura, we got so many, like, we got so much stuff in common. Might as well be just be besties. Except she's 15 years older than me. She only went to that first university for about a year and a half. I'm assuming she did well. I don't think she was kicked out or, like, asked to move. In November of 2000. Three, she had found a receipt on the ground and she used that to get the credit card information to buy food which same basically so we need to have like a discussion about timing here so this was in 2003 this was right when the internet started becoming a thing but it wasn't like profound yet you know what i mean i found this thing that actually the day of her disappearance on the day of her disappearance facebook was five days old so it just kind of like sets the scene for the like we're at so receipts back then had the whole credit card information on them how wild in my lifetime I failed to mention that she was caught, but then the charges were later dropped, so. On February 5th of 2004, she was working an overnight shift at her campus security job. I'm assuming she like answered the phones or watched monitors, I don't really know. But she was on the phone with her sister, and at 10.30 p.m. she broke down in tears and was just hysterical. However, when her supervisor actually passed her and was speaking to her, she claimed Maura was unresponsive and just was completely zoning out and wasn't able to focus at all. And at 1.20, Maura was escorted back to her dorm by her supervisor, and her supervisor asked her what was wrong, and she just said, my sister, and that was the only thing she said. This is just like a little side note, and it just kind of like messed up a little bit. Her sister actually was talking to her. It was not revealed until 2017 that her sister and her were actually talking about her sister's fiance. Her sister had had an alcohol problem, and she was in a rehab clinic for her alcohol problem. And the day that she brought, that Maura broke down in tears in her at her job, her sister's fiance took her to a liquor store where she proceeded to have a breakdown in the middle of the liquor store, but like, I would too, so. On February 7th of 2004, Maura's dad, Fred, actually came to visit her so they can go look for cars. He had then had dinner with her and um, Maura's friend, and then they took Fred back to his motel, and then they borrowed Fred's car to go to this party. And Maura arrived at this party at about 10.30 p.m., and at 2.30 a.m. the next morning, she actually left the party. At 3.30 a.m. on February 8th, so it's still like the night of the party, but it's the next morning, technically, Maura actually hit a guardrail and caused $10,000 worth of damage damages to her dad's car. And insurance actually agreed to pay for it, so that was pretty freaking sweet. So I had heard something about Moore's dad was not even upset. He was just glad that she was okay. What was a little bit suspicious, Moore's is a suspicious being for many reasons, but she had been at this party. She most likely was drinking. It was never confirmed that there was drinking because a sobriety test was never done, people. She was, she hit a guardrail, caused $10,000 of damage. Sobriety test was never done. She was never even given a ticket. The police here would give you a ticket for sneezing in the wrong direction. Well, that's insensitive, Matthew. Anyway, but from the 3.30 a.m. and she kind of like stayed the rest of the morning, the rest of the night with her dad in his motel. And then the next day he was able to rent a car and he drove Maura back to her door. At 4.49 a.m. there was actually a call from Fred's phone to Maura's boyfriend. But what they spoke about was never really revealed. So suspicious being, you know, Maura's dad was able to rent a car and then drop her back off at campus. And then he proceeded to drive home back to his home in Massachusetts in whatever city they lived in. At 11.30 p.m. that night, Maura's father actually spoke to her to remind her to get these forms from the Registry of Motor Vehicles. And I guess it's kind of like just like the logistics of the wreck and stuff like that that and she was also purchasing a new car i'm assuming because she was driving later you'll see anyway and then they had actually agreed to speak on monday the following day on february 9th so on february 9th at midnight so 
February 9th was a baby, like, was just a new baby day, and it was, like, the first couple of minutes into February 9th. I'm just trying to, like, make this as least confusing as possible, because when I say midnight, you're gonna think the night of February 9th into February 10th, but this is actually February 8th tonight into February 9th, if that makes sense. Midnight, February 9th, Maura was actually using her computer to map quest directions to Burlington, um, Virginia. There was no contact with Maura from midnight when she did this search to 1 p.m. Nobody had spoken to Maura at all that day, which isn't really that uncommon. I mean, if you think about but some days I don't even go a whole day without speaking to somebody until 7 30 p.m. So and at 1 p.m. she actually had emailed her boyfriend. And this is a quote from this email. I got your message, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking too much of anyone. I promised to call you today though. Um, she had actually made a call to rent a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire. It was her family's vacation spot. They had rented this condo before, but the owner actually did not rent it out to Mora. Either A, because she wasn't gonna rent a condo to a 21 year old girl, or B the condo was already rented. I would kind of think that if someone was like, I just wanna rent this condo condo for X amount of days. I'm 21 years old and I'm also coming alone when my family usually comes with me. I'd be, I don't know what I would think, honestly. Maybe I'd be like, sure, why not? Depends what kind of mood I'm in, honestly. The call only lasted about three minutes. At this point, they're tracking Moore's time through her cell phone and they're trying to account. When you do like a police investigation, you try to account for every minute that the person is awake and active to kind of like puzzle it all together. Because if you have someone who can account for their entire day but 10 minutes, you can kill somebody in 10 minutes. It's kind of like important, you know what I mean? I dropped you a bit so I can be like more in the frame because I kind of like sit kind of low when I'm eating and I just like felt, I feel more in the frame now. So at 1.13 p.m. Mora had made a call to a fellow nursing student. This conduct of this call doesn't really seem relevant, but the context of it was never revealed. Because Mora seems like a busy bee, she actually contacted her supervisor at 1.24 p.m. This is the supervisor of the nursing school. So I'm assuming this meant like her advisor or like her dean of her school. Um, and he, she like, did you see that big fly? She told them that she was going to be out of town for a week due to a death in the family. And she would be out for a week and she would call them back when she returned. Now, remember Mora's is, Mora is a suspicious beam. Actually, there was no death in the family. So when the family heard this, they were just like, we don't get it, no one died. At 2.05 p.m., this is 2004, so kind of bear with me. You had to call somebody, like a travel agent, to book a hotel. So at 2.05 p.m., she had called this number to book a hotel in Stowe, Vermont. And this was how they kind of like were tracking her movements. We don't know if she actually booked an appointment. This call lasted approximately five minutes. It is just my assumption that maybe to book a hotel would take a little bit longer than five minutes. Cause like even to do it online right now, it would take me at least five minutes to grab my credit card. So I don't even know. At 2.18 PM, she left her boyfriend a voicemail that said that he, she would talk to him soon. But the call lasted about a little bit more than a minute. It was then suspected that more of them packed her birth control clothes, textbooks, and toiletries into her car as she decided to leave campus in her 1996 Saturn sedan. This is why I thought maybe they actually purchased a car because she has a car now. She left her campus at 3.30 p.m. And it wasn't that big of a deal. Nobody really thought anything of it because there was a snowstorm happening, so attendance was excused from the school. At 3.40 p.m., she was seen withdrawing $280 from an ATM, and then she went to a liquor store and bought $40 worth of alcohol. Both footage from the ATM and the liquor store show that she was alone. They think that she was at least voluntarily going where she was, or at least she was by herself. I don't know where I'm going with this. And at some point, she did go to the motor registry of motor, registry, motor vehicle, and pick up those forms, but they don't know when she did that. It was just sometime in this like 20 minute span. And then between 4 and 5 p.m., it was decided that Maura did leave Amherst, Massachusetts. So back before like technology was really like advanced, you had to call your voicemail to actually get your voicemail messages. At 4.37, she called her voicemail and then was the last time she used her phone. Ever. Even with her MapQuest directions, calls to various people in various locations, a destination for her was never confirmed. They were never sure if she was actually going someplace or if she was just driving into the abyss of the United States. We don't know. At 7.27 p.m., a woman did report a car crash with a car facing the wrong way on the opposite side of the road. At first, she claimed that she saw a man sitting in the passenger seat with a cigarette, but then she wasn't sure if she saw a man at all. And then after further consideration, she thought maybe her or the police, one of the two, figured that the light from the cigarette could have actually been the light from her phone, from Maura's phone, and maybe she was making a call or something. But like we said, 4.37 was the last time she used her phone, so. There was, I'm guessing she crashed in a residential area because they keep mentioning these witnesses as neighbors. So a second neighbor actually saw what I assume was the first neighbor walking around the car or at least Mora walking around the car. And then the second neighbor, the second witness actually saw a third witness come up and expect the crash. This is where it gets kind of like odd because the third witness was a um, school bus driver. That's not why it's suspicious. Um, He actually spoke to Mora. He just thought that she was a bit shaken up because of the car crash, but he didn't see that she was bleeding or injured in any way. He just thought that 
that she was kind of like shaken up about it. He had offered her his cell phone, but she denied it, claiming that she had already called AAA and that they were on their way. But more as a suspicious being, and AAA had reported that she had never called them. Because 437, the last time she used her phone. But here we go, here we go. This is what's suspicious. Suspicious beans. The lady saw a light, could have been from the cell phone. Mora could have been trying to call AAA, and she thought that maybe she purchased, or, not purchased, she thought that maybe she made a call and that was like enough that it pinged somewhere and they were coming, I don't know. But the bus driver knew there was no service out in that section. So there you go. There was a light from the cell phone. She was calling AAA. They called it and go out. And the bus driver knew that there was no service. So the bus driver went back home and made a phone call to the police. This is where this fourth witness kind of gets a bit confusing because a call was made at 7.43 from the bus driver about the police. That was like what happened. And this woman claims that she saw a car at 7.37, a police car at 7.37, head to head with Moore's vehicle. But the police deny this and they said that there wasn't any vehicle there until nine minutes later at 7.45. They got there really freaking fast. But police, suspicious beans, they, we don't know them. We don't know what their motive is. Could a police car have been there and then just drove away thinking maybe it's not my problem? Yes. Could a policeman have done something to Mora? Yes. These are just possibilities. Allegedly. 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 These are just my theories as I'm sitting here talking about it. I'm just putting things together, man. Don't come for me. So when the police actually got there, they reported that nobody was actually at the crash. The car's completely immobile from hitting a tree and you could not drive it because something about a fan had hit the engine and it just couldn't be, it couldn't, nothing could happen with that car anymore. But they reported nobody was there. Suspicious. Both airbags were deployed and the car was locked, which was kind of strange. I don't know because I wasn't a sentient human being then. In 2003, if they had the click, click thing to lock your car. So it's kind of weird that you would like get out of the car and then lock it from the inside and then shut it. Cause if you are like, first of all, if you're Mora, I'm Mora, okay? I'm running away or I'm being kidnapped. I don't think to lock the car, but that's just also like, if I was getting kidnapped, I would lock the car, but I would be inside the car. I wouldn't be like trying to leave the car. I don't know. I don't know. So when the police arrived, there was red stains on the inside and outside of the car that they had deemed to be wine that Mora had purchased. They had found the receipt to the alcohol. They had found the receipt to the liquor store on the inside of the car. And they had also found the blank forms from the registry motor vehicles. They had found a AAA car, gloves, CDs, makeup, some diamond jewelry, which is like, if you're running away, why would you not bring that with you? The MapQuest directions and Mora's favorite stuffed animal. I lost count. I just did. I don't know what to do with my hands anymore. Oh, and a book about climbing mountains. This is bitch. What Mora did take with her was all of her credit and debt but cards, the alcohol, of course, and her cell phone. But her cell phone was never used again, so maybe it died. Also, where were the textbooks? Maybe she took the textbooks? I'm not sure. Textbooks are unaccounted for right now. Police went back to her dorm, and they had found all of her belongings that had actually been packed up. I think she had a solo dorm. I think that she didn't have roommates, and she had a single-person dorm. I think. Don't quote me, don't come for me. Here's where the police kind of, like, messed up. You ready? You ready? They didn't report her missing until noon of the next day. You slipping, police. This was almost 24 hours after Mora was last seen or heard from, you know. Um, just like a little side note, three to four months later, no, three months later, a man had actually come forward saying he had saw a young person walking quickly away from the wreckage, about four to five miles away. And so it was like in a different direction than the wreckage um, going east. He failed to recollect this because he thought that this in his memory. So here's the thing, the night happened and then a couple of days, like the day after she was reported missing and then maybe the day after, the evening after or the day after that, it was actually public news and then people kind of like travel word of mouth. So he probably didn't even hear about it until like a week or two after. And so at this point you're like, I don't really remember what day I saw. But then he, three months later, he I guess he checked his timestamps and he realized that he was actually coming from work at that time on that day and that's when he saw her and he was able to verify that that was the actual day so he reported it thinking that it could have been more. The initial investigation ran from February to ju 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 from February to June of 2004. I guess I must have been having like a stroke or something, I don't know. Mora was officially reported missing on February 10th at 12.36 p.m. Fun fact, February 9th is my grandma's birthday. Hi Gladys. She was last seen wearing a dark coat, jeans, and a hoodie with a black, no. She was last reported seen wearing a dark coat, jeans, and a black backpack. Black backpack is kind of important. That comes up later. Just, just a tap. Her parents were not even notified that she was missing until 3.30 p.m., three and a half hours after she was officially reported missing, and then more than 24 hours after she was last heard. Almost a full 24 hours 
from the wreck. I don't want this anymore. If Moore was not reported to have been back or communicate with anyone else, a search was scheduled to begin the following morning. This is 2004, so God help him. But the very like first like three to four hours after someone goes missing is the most crucial time, especially for kids. Um, she's not a kid, she's like a grown woman, but like it's kind of relevant because she's still like a young adult and she hasn't like made her way in the world yet, I guess. I don't know what I'm saying. What am I saying? Anyway, so the police kind of like dropped the ball on it because it's two days after she officially went missing and the most crucial time is a couple of hours after. So, suspicious beans. On February 11th of 2004, the search, the official first search did begin at 8 a.m. They brought sniffer dogs who took her gloves and then traced it 100 yards east from the wreckage, but they lost the scent then. And that plus that there was no footprints in the snow. Granted, this was two days later, so any snow that was falling could have covered the tracks to so like whatever, but the police concluded that she had continued her journey in a vehicle from that point on. At 5 p.m., Moore's boyfriend was interrogated and questioned. He was kind of like ruled out as a suspect. And at 7 p.m., it was ruled from the police kind of like publicly stated that they thought that she had run away to either start a new life or to commit suicide, unfortunately. While Moore's boyfriend was on the way to the police, he'd actually gotten a voicemail that it was just someone sobbing and then he believed it was Mora sobbing into her phone. Which, let's remember this is two days later at this point. She's missing for two days at this point. The police then accused Mora of being intoxicated when she had done the crash. However, no sobriety test was done and it goes against the bus driver's claims that she wasn't intoxicated or impaired in any way. He thought she was pretty alert as far as that goes. Here we go with the police dropping the ball again. A week later, Mora's parents realized that the authorities in Vermont were never notified that Mora was missing and could have possibly been headed in that direction because she had called about the hotels in Vermont. Remember? Remember? And it wasn't until a week later when their parents figured this out that they expanded the search to Vermont. So the first case is about two days late. And then this search is about a week late. And remember, the most crucial time was the first couple of hours. So they're kind of on the, like, they just dropped the ball completely. The ball has rolled away on the floor. It's way over there now. Like... Ten days after her disappearance, the FBI actually got involved and investigated. I guess because this was 2004 and this was all of the issue with 9-11 had happened in 2001, it's kind of fresh in people's minds at this point. Also because she did, could have possibly crossed state lines, that the FBI felt it was their job to get involved. And they started their own investigation and started from scratch and they investigated and interrogated everyone else all over again. They basically started from scratch. The work of the police were actually concerned that she was suicidal. They were not really concerned that it was a serial killer. There was a very similar case in Vermont where a girl around Moore's age had gone missing under similar circumstances, but the police didn't think this was work of a serial killer at all. By July of 2004, four official searches had been done and no evidence was recovered about Moore's, discover about Moore's disappearance. This part is kind of frustrating because this man had given Fred, Moore's father, a knife, a rusty knife, and he had said, my brother who has a had a criminal record in the past, has been freaking out since Mora disappeared, and I believe that he used this knife to kill Mora. When his family was questioned, they all said that he was just doing it for the reward money, but it does kind of play a factor later on. And actually a few days after Fred got the knife, the brother with the criminal background actually scrapped his Volvo, which is suspicious. A suspicious being. On February 9th of 2005, a one-year memorial service was held for Mora where they found her car. In late 2005, Mora's father actually filed a lawsuit against the authorities. It was over fi to see files in the case, so I'm assuming they wouldn't let him see that. In 2005, remember the internet is a fresh baby, and on a form about Mora's disappearance, there was actually a post about a backpack being found 100 yards away from where Mora's car crash was, and the senior assistant attorney general, Jeremy Strelzen, was, he responded that they were aware and there was nothing ever claimed else about the backpack. They, nobody knows if they actually did test him on the backpack or they don't know anything about the backpack so far. The police have been very high hush hush with this whole situation. In October of 2006, there was a group of ex-policemen, ex-detectives, ex-investigators, and just like other citizens had banded together, and they actually self-funded a search themselves, and they had actually got cadaver dogs, which are dogs that can smell dead bodies, and they got them, and they went bonkers over this house that was the house of the brother with the knife who scrapped his Volvo. They had actually gotten samples of the carpet, I don't know how, and the test results for that 
were never released to the public. Moore's father actually had a big disagreements with the authorities. He claimed that they weren't taking it seriously enough. They were treating it as a missing persons case and not a criminal investigation. And Strelzen, he disagreed and he did publicly state that they were treating it as a criminal investigation. So it's just kind of like this fight between Moore's dad and the authorities. Moore's dad actually dedicated like almost the rest of his life to this case. On the 10th anniversary of Moore's disappearance, there have been no leads at all. And Strelzen said that it's still an open and active case, but they have had no conclusive evidence tying to this case at all. It was actually on the 10th anniversary that Maura's father actually did that he has believed that she is dead and is just trying to recover her body at this point. He actually said specifically that he believed that she died the day that she went missing. And so as you remember, the police did not do anything until noon the day after she went missing and also the search did not begin until the morning after that. So it is kind of sad when you think about it because if the police would have taken it seriously the night of, Maura may be alive right now. You know what I mean? On the 13th anniversary of her case, the police did publicly state that her case is still open and active as of that day. As of 2019, on the 15th anniversary of Moore's disappearance, Moore's dad actually stated that he believed that his daughter was buried beneath the house of the one that the cadaver dogs sniffed the dead body on. And so the original owners did not agree with that, with any sort of search being done. But since then, the house was sold and the new owners did allow um, search to be done. They dug up the basement, but all they found was a pipe and like a rusty pipe and like other menial things that weren't tied to the case at all and that's kind of unfortunate. That is the case of Maura Murray's disappearance. I don't really know what to say because the police kind of dropped the ball and like I'm sorry police but like you just kind of did and like it was a different time and so like I'm not trying to like accuse anybody of anything just like in my opinion from what I've read. I know the police don't release information to try to like conceal the case. Here's the thing so like if the police know something that the public doesn't if someone they're investigating says this piece of information that only the police know they know that they know more than they're telling and it's also kind of to weed out people who just want to claim it for the fame people often claim participation in crimes just to get the notoriety of the people in jail do it for like reputation and power and like street cred and jail so that way they can kind of determine like if all they're stating is things that we've released to the public they can kind of like rule them out as being part of the case because they're not saying any of these hidden details that we know that the public doesn't know so I understand that and maybe they have like a surplus of information that the public doesn't know about and they'll like have the murderer or they know her more is or what have become of her and it's like on the tip of their tongue but like they just can't release anything so like that is possible I don't really know I would like to say that like I know there was something about more like having an affair with like her track coach I didn't assume that that had anything to do with the case really there was also something about more may have been pregnant but she was taking birth control pills so like I don't know why they thought that she could have been I mean you can't be pregnant if you anyway never mind let me just stop right there Matthew behave <laughs> anyway this has been cooking up crime episode two more Murray if you want to see a case if you want me to go over a case I will do my best to do my research in the meantime I'll see you in the next one Thank you.